Well, welcome to everyone. Um, this is the Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health uh, webinar for um, community organizations on smoke and heat. And today we've had two presentations. One's focused more on urban and more one's more focused on rural. Um, both have been recorded. So if you are interested in seeing both, we can send both out to your organizations. And thank you so much for being with us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we'd like to begin by acknowledging that Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health provide care on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish and Inklanaknuk nations, and are also home to many um, Métis chartered communities. Next slide, please. So welcome, thank you all for being here. We wanna start by acknowledging all the amazing work that your organizations do to support the communities that we all work with especially in the summer. And we know it's difficult and that the resources that we all wish were there are not always readily available. Um, but we, we will try to do our best to uh, advocate for filling some gaps in the system. And as we, as we do work, we can provide answers to your questions, um, provide letters of support for grants, um, data if we have it, and also provide presentations like the one we're gonna go through. Um, and Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to start with a uh, overview of summer health concerns from our health authorities. And we're going to hear from some amazing partners, the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, Mosaic, and SFU's Do-It-Yourself Air Cleaner Program. And we also have a Q&A session um, so we can answer all of your questions. And if we, so please do uh, save them in the chat as we go or answer them in, or put them in the Q&A and we will make sure that we get to all of them. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Sammy to do a quick um, Minty poll to get us started. Sorry, just one second. It's all right. Um, while we're getting started, I forgot to actually introduce uh, myself and our teams. So my name is Amy Lubick. I'm with the Vancouver, uh, I'm not, I'm with the Fraser Health team. <laughs> we work so closely together, I forget sometimes. But um, I'm the climate lead for Fraser Health. Um, I'm presenting today with my colleague, Megan, um, from Vancouver Coastal Health. And we have our amazing teams um, with us, Sammy and Tyler. And on, on our side, we have um, Rajpreet and Kareen, who have helped us with all the tech and presentations. So very much appreciate all of the folks here today. Right, so for those of you who've done a mentee poll before, this may not be new, but um, for everyone else, you can use the QR code or you can go to the website up above and enter in the code. Um, and we're just wanting to get a sense of who, who's in the room with us today. Um, so sharing however you'd like to, which community you're coming from or town or region, um, we can get a sense of uh, who's all gathered with us today. If you're not into Menti, that's also okay. You're welcome to pop it into the chat instead. Um, for the, throughout the session as well, you're welcome to sort of obviously chat in the chat, but the um, Q&A function for our Q&A with our medical health officers later on, um, if you could put that into the Q&A, um, that would be great. And you can also upvote the question. So that just gets helpful if we have a number of questions coming in, we're able to know which ones to prioritize based on what folks are interested in having answered because see which ones have been the most upvoted. Ah, uh, look at that. We got folks from all over Gibson's, uh, Surrey, Lemon, Bellacoola, Agassiz, Chilliwack, if that I've turned my head around, <laughs> lots of folks at that regional district, or Moody, Squamish. Did I miss anyone? Kamloops, Cash Creek, awesome. Thanks so much, folks. 
Okay, maybe we'll pop to the next one, Sammy. So you can share a bit about the populations that you work with. Um, so you know, again, this can be a big question. Feel free to throw in as many answers as you want to. Um, so we can get a sense of, you know, what sort of work folks are doing. And that just gives us all of us panelists a chance to maybe tailor some of the resources that we're talking about. Sometimes it's all the people. We, we deal with people of all ages. Oh my gosh, look at that. Newcomers, seniors, zero to five. Folks in Bella Coola, newcomers, youth, unhoused, everyone, <laughs> physicians, single parents, youth, First Nations, lots of folks. Oh my gosh, look at all the amazing work you folks are up to. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing. Fire service in the chat there. Awesome. Okay, immigrants. Okay, we'll pop over to the next question. So we just wanted to get a sense of if your organizations have heat and or smoke plans. If you don't, no big deal. I know this is still um, new for some people and also just trying to find the funding to do some of this can be challenging. Um, but just gives us a sense when we're trying to talk about some of these resources. So you might have one, maybe you have both. Maybe you don't have any at all, it's all okay. Awesome. Or with heat and smoke plans. Oh my gosh, you guys might be beating out the urban group from this morning. Lots with heat plans. Oh my gosh, that's great. Ooh. And then lots that don't have it as well. And that's also helpful to know, right? Because I think there's lots we can do about trying to increase supports to um, for organizations wanting to do some of that heat and smoke planning. And, and obviously there's barriers around staffing to do that and funding for that as well. Awesome. And the health authorities are also here to provide supports and resources for that. So feel free to reach out if that's something that you're encountering. Um, yeah. Okay. I think that's what we had for the Menti polls. Thanks so much, Sammy. I'll pass it back over to Amy. Oh, and I'll share our slides. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's great to know where folks are coming from. This is a really diverse crowd. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page with goals, um, we're hoping to provide some context for the summer, summer months coming up, um, provide information on the health hazards of smoke heat, um, as well as some on, on drought and window falls, and share some innovative practices of the great work that's going on across our regions, and importantly, answer your questions. So next slide, please. So we're going to jump right into heat and smoke uh, projections. Uh, next slide, please. And really, this is projected to be a very hot and smoky summer. So we're glad everyone's here with us today. Um, drought conditions are still very high across Canada and BC, and snowpack is at a 20-year low. And we're project projecting some weather systems that will bring heat. And additionally, there are over 100 forest fires in uh, still burning from last year. Uh, next slide, please. And we're concerned about extreme heat um, because we know that things like the heat dome that we all experienced, we used to think of that as a one in 1,000 year event, but we're actually now projecting that's more of a one in 10 year event. Um, and this is a graph of days above 30 that we expect to see in the future. Um, obviously they increase significantly. And BC seems to have lower temperatures than the rest of the province, but it's not the absolute temperature that import that's important. It's what we're used to. And also in many places across the country and even other places in uh, BC, they're more used to heat. So building materials are different, plans are in place, and very importantly, people have air conditioning, which is one of the most um, protective factors. And also in BC and a lot of regions, we actually see, like, we tend to think that we're cooler, but we see our temperatures going from pretty cool to really hot really quick. And so people don't have a time to acclimatize or get their plans in place. So that's another reason why we're really glad to have everyone with us today. Uh, next slide, please. And we're also talking more this year about wildfire smoke. We did a bit last year, but um, as you can see, 
um, we are seeing more and more um, hectares of um, of burning of wildfires across Canada, and last year was a record. So we're going to be talking about the short-term health impacts and what can be done, um, but we also know there's some long-term health impacts, and it does uh, contribute to a lot of um, premature um, mortality across BC and Canada. So we're hoping to, to help take care of folks on that note too. Next slide, please. So I'm going to um, take us through heat and then we're going to um, head into smoke. And vulnerability to heat is a combination of physical, social, and environmental risk. So it's how our bodies um, actually uh, deal with the heat. Some people are more vulnerable than others. Um, socially is more about who's in our network, who can check on us, and also what can we afford, um, and things like cooling or, or HEPA filters. And also environmentally, do we have access to cooling spaces? Do we live in a neighborhood that has an urban heat island that's more of a, well, maybe not urban heat island here, but very a lot of cement? Um, do we have a lot of access to green space or, or, or blue um, cooling features? So next slide, please. And so extreme temperature is dangerous for everybody. Um, so it's important that we all know the signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion and heat stroke and how to prevent it and what to do if you suspect you or others are um, experiencing that. So this is our heat poster. It's available on both of our websites. It's available in multiple languages. And so it can be shared in common areas and printed off to share with folks that you think might benefit from knowing those risks and the actions they can take. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, everyone is uh, susceptible to heat, but some people are a lot more at risk. Most people don't actually um, die or be hospitalized because of overheating, but through worsening of pre-existing conditions. So next slide, please. Um, seniors are a particularly vulnerable group. And this is partly because as we age, our bodies start losing the ability to regulate our internal heating and cooling systems. And it can be hard for people to notice that they're overheating or dehydrating. And also older people are more likely to have chronic illnesses, especially heart, lungs, and kidney disease. And when the body is already working really hard to keep those systems going, um, that extra pressure it takes to pump blood and um, breathe harder at, or um, the kidney functions that go with dehydration, um, that can put them in even more strain, which can be dangerous. And so Fraser Health has developed a primer for people to take care of elders and people with chronic conditions. And you can find that on both our websites. And it's also translated into multiple languages. Uh, next slide, please. And medications are also something that can put people at risk. And this is not a widely known uh, concept, but some medications make it easier for people to overheat or dehydrate or make them more sensitive to heat. Um, and also, uh, yeah, so this includes medications like laxatives or diuretics and some antipsychotics and depressants, or antidepressants rather. Um, and it's important that people talk to their doctor or pharmacist and just know that this is something they should be thinking about. Um, this is on our webpage and we do um, think it's important people continue taking their medications. So it's not saying don't, um, but do talk to someone about if there are more precautions that need to be taken. And next slide, please. And we're seeing more evidence of vulnerability for those experiencing mental health challenges, especially schizophrenia. Um, for example, in the 2021 heat dome, around 8 to 13 percent of people that we lost were those who experienced schizophrenia. And this is pretty high considering it's only about 0.78 um, percent of the population who does experience schizophrenia. So part of this is because people who live with schizophrenia if they're having an episode, they may not be aware of the heat around them or thinking about what precautions to take. Um, they may not have access to um, good shelter uh, or know to um, seek it. And also um, they may be taking medications that make them more vulnerable to heat. So for those who are taking care of folks with schizophrenia, uh, it's important to have a heat plan. Uh, as well as important to have a heat plan for people who have other mental health challenges. Um, as we mentioned before, they, there are a number of medications that put people more at risk, but also we do know that um, heat is associated with worsening of um, suicidal thoughts. 
And so there are a number of resources that can help people who are dealing with mental health challenges and organizations that support them. Um, these are through Towards the Heart, um, and that also includes what can be put in a cooling kit. And we will send out those resources after the presentation. And next slide, please. And in 2021, sorry, 2022, we saw an increase in more young people going to emergency departments with heat illness. And this may be because the people were outdoor workers or exercising outside. And WorkSafe BC saw an increase in uh, heat-related claims that year. We do know that people who work outside um, can be more marginalized workers and potentially not know the risks. Um, and some people come from hot countries, and so it's assumed they're acclimatized even if they're not. Um, so Fraser Health created a tip sheet for outdoor workers. Uh, WorkSafe has guidance for employers, and BCH has a fact sheet for people who work in food establishments, such as food trucks and restaurants. Next slide, please. And I always think that this is a really important slide because it demonstrates social vulnerability. You can say the majority of folks that we lost during the heat dome were elders, and that's shown in blue. But if you look at the green bars, you see that people that we often think is more vulnerable in residential or acute care, we actually saw a bit of a protective effect there. And it was the people who live in community, so not really connected consistently to the health care system that, were, that we lost more uh, frequently. Uh, many of those folks were lower income or people with um, disabilities, living alone or socially isolated. And so it's important that uh, we're all here today so we can work together to be able to reach those folks who are more isolated. And we also know that it's community organizations and neighbors um, who are often the first line of offense, defense when it comes to uh, extreme heat. And next slide, please. So we are trying to um, promote the idea of wellness checks. Um, the first the first document on this slide is the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health's Checking Guide, which is for more for individuals, and it's available in five languages. So it talks about who's at risk, what can you help them to do, how do you um, check the temperature inside their home, and what are your decided upon actions if someone is in distress, um, and how do you get them to a community um, a community cool spot or to a neighbor's or somewhere where there's air conditioning if they need it. Um, we're also very excited about the work that Mosaic is doing in a lot of organizations across our regions um, to develop a check-in program for folks who are not comfortable speaking in English. I think they do it in about 33 different languages. And we also have a check-in guide for organizations that want to run these kind of programs. So um, this is available on our websites and they all, and VCH also has training videos and train the trainer videos available online. Uh, next slide, please. So as we talk about check-ins, it's really important to emphasize that people don't die because it's hot outside. They usually die because of temperatures inside. This is a graph from the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, and it looks at temperatures in two different homes uh, during the 2021 heat dome in Abbotsford. Uh, one of them is with air conditioning. You can see that one in blue. So temperatures always stay in that very safe range. The temperature in red is from the house that doesn't have air conditioning, and the a black line is from the outdoors. So as the outdoor temperature gets starts getting very high, you'll notice the te indoor temperature doesn't quite reach the outdoor temperature, but it also never cools down nearly as much as the outdoor temperature does. So during the course of these four to five days of heat, the indoor temperature really just steadily rises and past that red band that you can see between 26 and 31. And after 26 degrees, it starts getting dangerous for people who have who are more vulnerable to heat. Below 26 degrees is considered safe for everybody. Um, so at night, it cools down a little bit, but it's still not getting into that safe um, area. And our bodies really do need that overnight cooling to reset and to, to heal from that overheating process. Um, and you'll notice that the uh, outdoor temperatures um, and the peaks of the indoor temperatures don't line up. So it's actually hottest inside later in the evening, which is a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that it's important to, if you are doing a cooling center, if that's something the that organization can do, to make sure that it is open if possible later on at night where people, when people's homes are still really hot. Um, and you can also see that after those high peaks, 
there's when technically the extreme heat emergency was over, the temperatures in the home that didn't have air conditioning are still really hot in that semi-dangerous range. And so it's really important that if check-ins are being done, keep them going for a couple of days after a heat event. Uh, next slide, please. And so we are also learning a lot about fans in the last couple of years. So we often think about fans as something that's going to be really helpful to cool down our bodies, but fans don't directly cool the air and they don't directly cool people. They can feel very nice, um, but we don't recommend them as a primary source of cooling um, because they don't cool down our core body temperature and that's when we're holding in all of that heat. It can actually provide a false sense of cooling when we really want people to start leaving their homes if, if temperatures do reach over 31 degrees. They can be used safely to pull hot air out of uh, a room once it gets cooler outside than in or pull cool air inside but we don't recommend using them on people and when it gets really hot especially over 35 degrees we don't recommend them at all and that's the point where you're basically just blowing hot air back onto ourselves which can actually make things worse and there is a fa uh, fan faq as well as an infographic in a couple of different languages on our websites uh, next slide please And as we mentioned before, um, air conditioning is probably the, the safest um, means of cooling folks. Um, we know not everybody has it, and it can be um, kind of an economically prohibitive thing to, to invest in. So lower income people, especially living in apartments or condos or mobile homes, tend to struggle with heat. And if they can't invest in a, an air conditioner, BC Hydro uh, last year started this free air conditioning program. So it is available through healthcare providers, particularly home care, but um, there is a low income stream and cutoffs are available on the website. So if you do um, have clients that would benefit from this, highly recommend this program. Um, renters do need to get permission from their landlords, um, but BC Hydro does have a an FAQ uh, form that will help kind of help make that argument. And Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health also have a best practices uh, guidance for landlords and stratas that can also help provide some of that uh, argument for providing a cool space. And now I'll pass it on to Megan. Great, thanks so much, Amy. Uh, so as Amy talked about earlier, um, we're expecting things to be quite smoky this summer. Um, and we're seeing that wildfires are becoming more common and severe in BC and around the world. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've seen wildfire smoke coming from nearby and also hundreds of kilometers away. Uh, wildfire smoke can last anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks. Um, and it's a mixture of different air pollutants. So it depends on what's being burned, where it's being burned, uh, the wind direction and sun exposure. Um, and wildfire smoke is made up of several different pollutants. So the greatest health concern um, from wildfire smoke is actually the fine particles, um, also known as PM 2.5. These are of a concern because they're so small that they can actually go into our lungs and even our bloodstream. Um, there's emerging research showing that there's even long-term health impacts from um, and multiple exposures or even just one season. Um, and as we've heard, it's supposed to be smoky, so it's important that we would take actions to prepare ourselves and to be aware of what we can do to reduce our exposure over the summer. This is our VCH and Fraser Health wildfire smoke poster. It shows several of the um, common and more severe symptoms. For the column on the right-hand side, the more severe symptoms, those are where we're wanting to direct people to seek medical attention. Everyone can be impacted by wildfire smoke, but some people are more vulnerable to the health impacts. That includes people with chronic respiratory conditions like COPD and asthma, uh, people with heart conditions, diabetes, as well as people who are pregnant, young adults, and older adults. And of course, um, there's physical risk, but there's also environmental risk factors. So those are people who are more exposed to wildfire smoke. Uh, that's folks who might be working outdoors, uh, people who are unhoused, and people who don't have access to filtration um, or air cleaners in their spaces. It's not always easy to avoid wildfire smoke, especially if it's smoky periods that are happening often or over longer periods of the summer. Um, but there are actions that people can take before and during the smoky periods to protect against exposure and health impacts. 
We recommend regularly checking on your local air quality and referring to the Air Quality Health Index to plan out your day. So we're going to go through the Air Quality Health Index in a few slides. We also recommend finding cleaner air, and there's a number of different ways to do that. So um, ideally, people can access cleaner air in their homes uh, using portable HEPA air cleaners or by adding filtration to HVAC systems. If that's not possible, there's also homemade DIY box fan air filters, and we're going to hear more about that from our colleagues at Simon Fraser University um, and the workshops that they're doing for those later on in our webinar. Um, and people can also visit public spaces that tend to have cleaner and cooler air. So uh, things like community centers, malls, libraries, and buildings that have air conditioning or central air. The BC Centre for Disease Control has many helpful wildfire smoke fact sheets, including ones for those box fan air filters. And then also you can see the one here on the right is on how to pick a portable air cleaner. There's lots that are out there. So how do we navigate which one might be the most effective for us? So um, there's some additional actions for smoke, and that includes possibly postponing or limiting outdoor activities, especially for people who are at risk. Um, if outdoor activities can't be avoided, we want to take it easy and take frequent breaks. If we think about being outside and being active, um, that often causes us to breathe harder. <sighs> and if we're doing that, we're more likely to breathe in more smoke. If outdoor activities can't be avoided, we want to consider a mask, but not all masks are actually going to be protective. So uh, the most protective are well-fitted masks, especially ones like N95s, KB95s, and KF94s, um, and trying to ensure that they're actually fitted well around our face, and even looking up occupational health and safety recommendations about how to properly fit masks. Uh, there's some protection from cloth masks with three layers or disposable medical masks, and unfortunately, there's no protection from masks with one layer, bandanas, scarves, or t-shirts that we're pulling up over our face. We also want to keep in mind that when there's air quality events or wildfire smoke, there may also be heat events at the same time. We're often asked about those compounding um, priorities. So do we open up our windows to get um, to cool off our spaces if it's also smoky outside? Um, ideally, folks can access both cooler and cleaner air. Uh, but if that's not possible, um, heat is generally the more immediate risk for most people and heat response should be prioritized. This is that air quality health index I talked about. Um, it's a tool that provides health recommendations for each level of air quality. Um, and that's that PM 2.5. You can see on the left hand side of this chart, um, it includes messages for the general population as well as people who are, who are at higher risk. It also has actions to reduce exposure to smoke. And keep in mind that there's no safe level of exposure to PM 2.5. Um, and people may experience health impacts even in that blue lower category. The air quality can fluctuate throughout the day, so it's important to regularly monitor the air quality closest to you, so those sensors that are closest to you. We'll show you a map in a second. And then also checking in with this air quality health index to help plan out your day. Maybe it's a little bit sm less smoky in the afternoon and it's safer to go outside to the park, and maybe that's helpful for your mental health. And staying inside is not something that's feasible for you, so trying to use this as a tool to help you navigate those smoky conditions. These are the two air quality maps we recommend. The one on the left is the BC Air Quality Index um, Health Index map that shows the government air quality monitoring stations. These stations are spread across the country, but because they're across the country, there's gaps in coverage. There's not as many of them. On the right hand side is the uh, low cost air quality map uh, sensors. Sorry, it's the AQ map. It's one of a couple of different low cost sensor maps. We like this one because it's the easiest for people, like people to navigate. Um, some of the other ones can be a bit more technical and harder to read. Um, these low cost sensors are put out by keen individuals, local governments, health authorities, and industries. Um, and you can see in these pictures, if you're looking at both of them together, they're for the same region. And there's quite a few more of those low cost sensors that are than there are those government air quality monitoring stations. So this AQ map can be particularly helpful for communities that might not have be nearby an air quality station. So especially rural or remote folks who are often not close to a uh, government air quality monitoring station. And it helps you see the local air quality for your for you and people you're looking after. Um, because that air quality changes so quickly, we want to be trying to find uh, the data for the area that's closest to us. 
Here's some additional wildflower smoke resources we recommend. I'm not going to go through all of these. We'll send them out afterwards. There's stuff for childcare facilities, um, outdoor public gatherings. Um, and there's also um, information with the wildflower smokes that Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health have. So drought can threaten drinking water supply and safety. It can also impact regional food security and access to traditional foods. Drought can um, uh, also impact mental health as people's livelihoods and day-to-day -day activities are affected. Um, as Amy mentioned, we're seeing increased drought across the province. And we know that there's communities within the VCH and Fraser Health regions that are experiencing some severe drought conditions. And we wanted to provide some additional resources for that. So here are a number of BC drought resources, including drought um, uh, preparedness and response information. We're not going to go through all of these. They're going to be sent out afterwards. Um, we also just wanted to flag that both BCH and Fraser Health are here to support your communities. Please email our teams anytime if you're encountering challenges with drought in your communities. Um, we may be able to develop public health guidance for drought um, and also connect you with other public health teams that can support. For example, we have drinking water officers who specialize in water quality and safety. Spring and summer months also bring an increased risk of children falling from windows. Uh, every year the, over the last 10 years, the BC Children's Hospital has cared for an average of 13 children per year who fall through windows. Children under the age of five are at the highest risk of falling from windows and falls occur most frequently between April and September uh, when the weather is warmer and we're all opening those windows up. Uh, window screens are often thought to provide a barrier to prevent falls, um, but they're actually not safety devices and they can easily give way under the weight of a child pushing through them. Uh, most window falls happen from windows where the window screens were properly installed. So it's not that they're faulty, it's just that they're not actually effective at preventing falls. With appropriate safety precautions in place, falls from windows are largely preventable. Uh, so here are some of the safety tips in, and that includes installing window guards and stops and also placing furniture away from windows to prevent children from climbing up onto furniture. On an organizational level, there's things that we can all do to increase public awareness about this and share information with staff, volunteers and families in our communities and hopefully be able to prevent some of these falls from happening. So thanks for all the organizations that filled out our pre-season survey. We asked a bit about what you'd all like to have in these presentations and you know who you'd like to have in our webinars. Um, so this section is really in response to that. We had a lot of questions about heat and smoke response. So we're wanting to share a bit of information about the provincial response system and then also some recommended actions. This is the BC heat alert response system. There's two levels. Level one is heat warning. Level two is extreme heat emergency. The map on the left shows the different heat warning regions in the province. Each region um, has different temperature thresholds because the connection between heat and health varies across the province. For example, people in the interior of the, um, are used to hotter temperatures than we are on the coast. The temperature thresholds are based on public health data and they're regularly reviewed. The chart on the right shows the expected public health risk, historic frequency of each level of warning, and the heat thresholds for each region. If you're wanting to know what region you are, you can look it up in the BC Heat Alert Response System document. Um, most of them are fairly straightforward. We will just flag that for Fraser Canyon, it can be a bit confusing, and you folks are in the southeast region. This is how the BC Heat Response System is activated. The yellow banner on the right is the yellow weather statements. And these are early warnings that are sent out by Environment and Climate Change Canada for folks who are doing heat response. Um, if you're not signed up for this list, sir, feel free to reach out to us and we can help connect you to those notifications. They're not set out for every heat alert, it just they do it for some of them as an early warning if it's warranted. The blue banner on the left hand side is an example of a heat warning from that Environment and Climate Change Canada Weather Can app. Heat warnings are issued by Environment and Climate Change Canada, but those are based on those predetermined temperature thresholds set by the BC Heat Committee, a group of public health experts. The first heat warning of every season um, may include a special weather statement. Um, so that's where they might diverge slightly from some of this process. So instead of initially declaring a heat warning, it might be a special weather statement first. And that's to allow partners of additional time to prepare and get mobilized. It's also because people in the community may be at higher risk at lower temperatures earlier on in the season. Amy had mentioned that, how folks aren't quite acclimatized yet to heat um, and may not be prepared to respond to heat yet. Um, and take actions. Um, so that might be something that you see coming out. And extreme heat emergencies are activated by Environment and Climate Change Canada, but that's based on a decision by that BC Heat Committee. 
Um, and the province may issue a broadcast intrusive alert for an extreme heat emergency. That's like those um, emergency alerts most of us got yesterday, the ones that buzz on our phones. It may or may not happen. It's just an option for an extreme heat emergency. The BC HARS document sh um, shown on the right provides suggested preparedness, response, and communication levels, our actions for all levels. Here are the key recommendations for community organizations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that these are definitely based on funding and, and capacity that you might have, and also maybe done in partnership. We appreciate that these may not all be feasible. Um, there are options that could be taken. Um, some of the key supports would include preparing for and providing information about heat risks and local cooling resources, also potentially providing um, check, heat check-ins like Amy mentioned or opening a cooling space. We've linked the VCH guidance here for creating cooler spaces, which has tips on how to open and increase accessibility of cooling spaces. Uh, this includes things like allowing pets, having activities and accessible washrooms, all things that we know help encourage folks to spend longer amounts of time in these spaces and hopefully reduce some of the, um, the health impacts from being out in the heat by spending more time in those cooler spaces. For an extreme heat emergency, it would be increasing public messaging and activating or even increasing outreach activities that you've been doing for a heat warning. This is how our air quality alerts are activated in BC, depending on your region. Um, I know most of you folks here are I signed up for the rural remote webinar, so we're probably outside of the Metro Vancouver region, so we won't necessarily dive into that, but all that to say that they're in within Metro Vancouver, um, there is specific Metro Vancouver alerts from, surprise, surprise, Metro Vancouver. Uh, they monitor the air quality and they also send out those alerts. There's a specific list you can sign up for early notifications if you're working or living in Metro Vancouver at all. For outside of Metro Vancouver, your air quality is monitored by environment, uh, the Ministry of Environment, and that includes air quality advisories and the Smoky Skies bulletins. Both of these channels of air quality advisories are then amplified through Environment and Climate Change Canada's uh, different notification system. So that's that Weather Can app, um, the Hello Weather service that you can get clients to call into if they don't have tech. Um, and then also those online notifications. And just a note that these are all called something different under Environment and Climate Change Canada. All of these different advisories are called uh, special air quality statements. So it will still be put through, it's just gonna be called something different under ACCC. Uh, these are suggested preparedness, response, and communication activities for wildfire smoke. Once again, based on capacity and funding, maybe done in partnership. Uh, Preseason may include sharing smoke preparedness information with community and creating a smoke readiness plan. We've linked an ASHRAE document with detailed guidance for increasing building protectiveness. During an air quality event, you may want to consider sharing key messages about opening a cleaner air space and having additional um, or opening a cleaner air space and then having additional supports for outdoor workers and people who are unhoused. We've also linked the Health Canada guidance here for cleaner air spaces if you're interested in trying to open one of those up. One of the key recommendations for smoke isn't to reduce your exposure or to stay inside away from the smoke, um, but how protective are our buildings? Uh, these two graphs show two different buildings. The one on the left has um, is doesn't have anything extra to protect um, it and keep or any additional actions to keep the smoke out. The one on the right has additional actions to try to keep the smoke outside of the building. The blue lines are outdoor air. The green lines are indoor air. So you can see that PM 2.5, that wildfire smoke is the column on the left. And you can see that that air goes up and down with the smoke. So the one on the left hand side, there's some protection from being inside that green line, but it's pretty close to that blue line of outdoor air. So it's not that protective of the building. On the right hand side, this building is quite protective. You can see the green line at the bottom, it barely even has any blips. So it's keeping most of that smoke outside of the building. That's the gold standard, what we're aiming to try to have our buildings look like. Um, that's some of that ASHRAE guidance that was mentioned in the previous slide. Um, it's also helpful to use air quality sensors to try to monitor or check if your building's actually being protective. So if you're interested in those low cost sensors and you wanna know how to go about doing that, feel free to send us an email and we can provide you some more information. Uh, we often talk about what's in our emergency kit, but it's also important to consider who is in our emergency kit. Um, so here are some resources as you're planning and potentially doing response. I think most of us are aware of 811, so HealthLink BC. There's uh, public health nurses available 24 hours a day um, that who can answer health questions. Um, 
if you're looking for community emergency planning, um, you know, community emer uh, emergency centers or resources, local government or your First Nation are the first folks to chat to about that. Uh, for questions about um, health or needing connections to health services, teams or training, if you want to know about the most up-to-date health guidance or need support with heat or smoke planning, really anything with the heat or smoke response, shoot us an email. We're happy to answer questions or make connections to folks who would maybe be the most relevant to answer those questions. Um, if you'd like emailed health guidance for when these heat and smoke alerts are happening, um, please sign up for either the Fraser Health or Vancouver Coastal Health NGO Seasonal Readiness Listservs. If you guys are in this webinar, you might already be on there, but if not, feel free to email us and check, and we're happy to add you to that list. Thanks for your attention. Your work is so valuable uh, for the health and the resilience of our communities. We really appreciate you being here today, um, and we're also here to support. Once again, please reach out with any questions that you might have at any time. I'll pass it back over to Amy and our other panelists. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, next on our, so just to remind folks, we will have questions at the end of, of the presentations, but um, our next presenter is um, Shahid from the um, Aboriginal Housing Management Association. Thank you so much for being with us. Great, thank you so much, Amy. What a great presentation. I learned a lot, so thank you. <laughs> um, yes, so I'm Shahed, as Amy mentioned, and uh, I will be going through a short overview of a re report that recently our organization, the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, published. And um, I'm going to address my technical challenges and see if I can share my slides. <laughs> Wonderful. So I hope everybody can see my slides. Is it working? Okay, great. Yeah, we can just see your presenter notes, um, Shahed. Oh, you can see it or you can't yeah, see it? Yeah, we're seeing the presenter. Oh, you're seeing it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not, the, not the presentation. So maybe a different screen. How do I fix this? <laughs> Yeah, I think if you reshare and then you um, click oh, a different there. screen, maybe. Maybe this is, is it better now? Uh -huh. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, because uh, I was not realizing that I was sharing. Okay, great. So as I mentioned, I am going to briefly provide an overview of the report um, that is the result of engagement with our urban indigenous housing providers across British Columbia. And before I start, um, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I am joining you today from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Kukiklam Nations. At AMA, we honor elders past, present, and future from all nations and traditional territories. And the land and waters that are colonially named British Columbia, as we all know, are home to many, many distinct First Nations. Again, as... Um, I've been introduced already, but very briefly, I am the Energy Projects Coordinator with uh, AMA. I've been working in the Indigenous and, uh, and uh, Energy sector for a while now, and uh, I'm quite new with AMA, but learning quickly, hopefully. And I was the uh, lead researcher with this project, and I just want to recognize and make it clear that my perspective and language are very much so limited to my position as a witness and observer of the lived experiences that I'm sharing today. And all the, all the credit goes to our housing providers that were very generous to actually uh, participate in this project. And AMA, as some may know, uh, sitting in this room stands for the Aboriginal Hous Housing Management Association. We are a members-based nonprofit, and our members are Indigenous housing and service providers across BC. And we make up uh, quite a big portion of Indigenous housing providers all across Canada. Our mission is to lead and advance the housing rights for all Indigenous people living in British Columbia. And we provide a different array of different services for our members, from advocacy to portfolio management and operations. And so today I will briefly just go through uh, the research journey that led to this report, uh, some of the stories that we heard from our members, 
and uh, pathways, hopefully, for our organization, our partners um, to move forward as we try to better plan for future climate emergencies. So as we have been hearing, I guess, in all the other presentations, um, unfortunately, we know that climate change is causing more intense and much longer heat waves, both across, across British Columbia and uh, globally. So uh, again, in 2021, as many may remember, we experienced a horrible extreme heat, heat dome, that uh, significantly and deeply impacted a lot of indigenous populations and uh, more uh, and other vulnerable communities. And for indigenous and urban indigenous populations, this is, of course, we know that their risk is much higher to extreme heat due to legacies of colonialism, right? That has led to, you know, poor quality housing, uh, chronic health conditions, lack of resources, and of course, many, many other systemic barriers that they face. So uh, for us to better understand what these barriers are and fill some of these knowledge gaps that we had in responding to the impacts of climate change, uh, we decided to, I guess, embark on this journey and better and more meaningfully engage our housing providers so that we can understand what the priorities and needs are and help them better next time when uh, climate emergencies happen. And thankfully, we're able to uh, engage with 16 of our team members uh, from different housing providers across all, all of the province. And this report is essentially informed by all the comments and inputs and uh, stories that they shared with us. And uh, these uh, virtual interviews were performed last year during the months of um, August, September, and October. And essentially, the report, uh, as maybe some of you have seen on our website, was published in April. So this is just one example of this quote of the many, many impactful stories that were shared during our interviews. As you can see very clearly from this uh, quote, yeah, the heat dome uh, had very, very devastating impacts on many communities around British Columbia. So yes, I'm just gonna share some of the key messages that we heard from uh, and the, you know, the common threads that we heard during this conversation. Um, the most important one being that housing providers told us that they face complex interconnected set of barriers, right? That makes them a lot more vulnerable to extreme heat. So uh, they need uh, wraparound support systems so that they can you know, better respond to these intersecting challenges. Because again, none of this happens in isolation for our indigenous housing providers. Uh, another key message that really stayed with me was the fact that um, they had deep and long lasting relationship with their tenants. They knew their tenants so intimately and so closely. So that really helped them be able to better respond uh, to the extreme heat and help their tenants stay safe and cool in their, in their units. So yeah, th those stories were very, very impactful and really stayed with me after the, after the conversations. And again, as many sitting in this room may already know, um, unfortunately due to systemic underfunding on indigenous housing, uh, our indigenous household uh, households live in poorly built, low quality, and a lot of times inefficient homes. And unfortunately, a lot of times these homes are really not built for the local environment. So that means that households tend to be thermally uncomfortable. Uh, they had to deal with poor, poor insulation, mold, and high heating and cooling costs. So these are becoming, already are big, big issues. But as we grapple with climate emergencies, these are becoming even more urgent issues. So all of our participants told us that they are very committed to building more energy efficient homes. They really need that to happen so that you know, they can provide their households with better protection when uh, climate emergencies happen. So building energy efficient homes is actually a very important step, right? When it comes to actually planning for climate emergencies. And as again, um, many may already know, and as we heard throughout their presentations today, working together and building intentional alliances is really, really important. So different agencies, organizations, and governmental institutions, we all of us really need to uh, collaborate better so that we can plan for extreme heat and climate emergencies better. So we can help our uh, clients and housing providers and service providers across British Columbia. So just again, briefly, I'm going to go through and dig deeper a bit into the experiences that housing providers had during the heat dome, uh, what their needs were and some sometimes counter narratives that you know assumptions I had that were completely debunked during my conversations which uh, may be of interest of participants today. So again uh, you know they reported that extreme heat was happening at the same time as we heard wildfire smoke all of these tend to happen at the same time so uh, participants told us that they had to deal with the compounding effects of all of this so all of these intersecting challenges 
you know, result in um, terrible mental and physical health impacts for their tenants. So in addition to having access to cooling equipment, which is essential, like, again, as we heard during the previous presentation, other tools like HEPA filters and maybe cooling kits can really help housing providers uh, make indoor environments safer and healthier, right? So again, that wraparound support becomes really, really important. And it's not just you know, the direct health impacts, right, for tenants. Uh, the harsh conditions during an extreme climate event can really jeopardize food security, access to traditional medicine, sacred spaces, and cultural practices. So it's not just an isolated emergency for these communities, but it's rather like a multi-array crisis, right? That can jeopardize uh, so many different aspects of someone's uh, life. Again, in this code, as we see, unfortunately, because resources can be really limited when an emergency like that hits, housing providers have to unfortunately make difficult decisions sometimes. Who gets to get the emergency kits and who gets to get that cooling equipment or that air conditioner or that fan. So this again can be really, really difficult times for our housing providers. So um, yeah, unsurprisingly, it was very overwhelming for them when the extreme heat hit. Uh, they're already uh, societies and um, indigenous housing uh, providers already are dealing with limited capacity. So when something like that happens, it can be a huge strain on their staff and resources. So uh, the truth is that tenants living in urban indigenous housing have specialized needs and priorities. So, you know, the traditional social housing programs that we may see sometimes are not sufficient and adequate to actually address these complex needs. So housing managers tell us that, you know, they need to look for uh, specialized staff members who actually have the right training and values and capacity to be able to attend to these complex needs. So unsurprisingly, you know, hiring and retaining staff can be a big challenge for them. So again, when an emergency happens, this can be really, really tough for them to actually deal with. But, you know, at the same time, um, although those challenges uh, do come and, you know, they can be very, very stressful, our housing providers are also super innovative and <laughs> very creative. Uh, this quote is from one of our housing providers telling us that they were able to use existing mill derivative routes and staff to distribute fans and cooling cooling equipment to their communities. And I, and I thought that was very, very innovative of them. And honestly, again, that was one of the biggest uh, takeaways for me was the fact that um, they were so resilient and resourceful and so, so caring and passionate about the community members. And, you know, despite all that, all those limitations, they still made sure their tenants were safe. Yes, again, we heard during the previous uh, presentation, it's really important to have a direct and timely communication with tenants during a climate emergency. So thinking about developing and distributing those targeted information packages that have the heat related health risks to vulnerable tenants and based on their specific needs and unique needs. So sometimes this can be you know, relying on external resources like the different health authorities and maybe getting the package from them and then distributing to tenants. But again, we heard from housing providers that because they have that intimate relationship with them, with their tenants, they used many, many different different means of communication. And in-person check-ins, for example, were um, very, very effective. Again, because a lot of times uh, tenants tend to feel isolated and due to a stigma and sometimes historical trauma, they tend to be a little reluctant to ask for help um, from service providers. So because house, uh, our housing providers were able to you know, adopt that trauma-informed approach, they were able to ensure that vulnerable tenants stay safe and comfortable in their own homes. So uh, I think it's really important for um, external resources and fund funding streams to be, again, very mindful of these holistic and um, alternative approaches that housing providers need to adopt when it comes to these type of emergencies. And that's exactly what our participant told us, that you know, current uh, funding streams can be very cumbersome and very narrow, and uh, this makes it very difficult for them to actually access, you know, the, the, the incentives that they very much so need to support their tenants. Again, um, insisting on that <laughs> alliance building and partnerships, uh, this is again, direct quote telling us that, you know, we need to better work together and learn how to collaborate better with each other so that we can help uh, the the um, the tenants and housing providers that are in most need during these emergencies. 
And uh, yes, I've already talked about energy efficiency and, and the importance of it to actually build climate resiliency. But another important uh, message that was delivered to us during this project was that while it's important to prioritize transitioning to low greenhouse gas emissions, it's also important to balance that with ensuring that tenants have access to reliable, affordable, and accessible cooling and heating systems. So it is not just about, for, for our housing providers, it is not just about that. It's also about the, um, the equity aspect of you know, transitioning to low, low greenhouse gas emissions. So this debate, again, comes back to you know, the push for electrification and ensuring that the transition is equitable and centering you know, most, most vulnerable communities, including urban indigenous populations. So yes, they were all committed to building more energy efficient homes because they understand the importance of that. But on the path to that, they really face a lot of barriers when it comes to agency to do what is right for their communities, but also resources and funding. And again, we all know that the aging infrastructure is a big challenge for urban indigenous housing and you know, electrical capacity and infrastructure in older buildings can be a significant barrier. So again, when we think about pushing for these funding for electrification and low greenhouse gases, we need to think about what that actually means for older buildings, because that can double or triple the cost for some of these projects. So funders need to also think about that and not be reluctant to provide the needed investment because older portfolio may actually be at the bottom of the, um, I guess, uh, investment opportunities for a lot of these for a lot of these funders. So uh, in addition to that, a big uh, another big message that was shared with us with some folks living in regions that are a bit far from metropolitan areas is that hiring and securing qualified uh, contractors can be a major barrier. So while again, they are very committed to retrofit projects and energy efficiency, they find that uh, finding folks who can actually do the work can be a big barrier for them to pursue these type of projects. Again, I'm, I know I talk about energy efficiency a lot, but it's because uh, I think it's really important for us to recognize the role that energy efficiency and climate resiliency can play in maintaining a community's well-being during an extreme heat event and a climate emergency. Why? Because it is so closely intertwined with a high quality housing, adequate ventilation, reliable air conditioning, all important factors to ensure a community's well-being. So that's why I keep you know, going back to energy efficiency and climate resiliency. So yes, we've talked about air conditioners a lot, and um, I am uh, very glad that there uh, there was so much information about uh, potential programs and existing programs already from BC Hydro and a lot of other partners. And obviously, you know, when when extreme heat happened, because units were so unbearably hot, folks were so happy to get these air conditioners. It was provided much much needed relief. But as someone that I just saw, uh, at, in the in the in the question section had, had asked about opportunities to access funds to actually address higher energy burdens. I think this is actually uh, was one of the messages that we heard from folks. And uh, while it's true that these air conditioners may not a lot of times use a lot of electricity, but we have a lot of folks and tenants who are already struggling to pay their bills. And with the rising cost of living, this is already a problem. So uh, yes, this was actually one of the things folks told us that yes, uh, they, they love having air conditioners, but they also want to see more programs and incentives that would help their tenants pay these increased costs. So this is very much so uh, an existing and big problem for a lot of our housing providers. And in addition to that, it was interesting to hear that, um, you know, common cooled areas, while they're very helpful for a lot of tenants, we heard from our participants that most of the tenants wanted to stay in their own spaces. And that kind of shifted the narrative for housing providers that going from trying to have one common cooled area, shifting to trying to make sure that tenants are cooled and safe in their home, own homes. And this may have a lot of a lot of different reasons. Some told us that you know folks have a different uh, thermal comfort levels, right? Uh, for example, elders may prefer higher temperatures. I may not even use their air, con air conditioners that much, but it's crucial for them to actually have the option to cool down because when an extreme heat event happens, right, it can bring with it very dangerous health impacts. In addition to that, uh, you know, a lot of these programs focus on apartments and multifamily homes and single family dwellings tend to be kind of left out from incentive programs. One of our participants told us that it's great to have air conditioners, but one air conditioner unit is not enough 
right, to cool down a whole house. So we need to see more incentive programs or financial help for single family dwellings to be able to actually have the cooling that they need. And I'm really hoping some of these new incentive programs that are coming out is going to help us actually achieve that. And of course, again, electrification, with that comes increased pressure on the electricity grid and potential power outages, which is a big concern again for our housing providers. So if there are any partners sitting here that are working in that sector, I think uh, we really need to think about that and how we're going to address and make sure that vulnerable communities are not left without power during uh, climate emergencies. This is again a direct quote um, from one of our one of our housing providers telling us that yes, increased cost from running air conditioners during hot summers and and during heat domes and climate emergencies is a big problem. So operational costs do increase, and uh, they are calling for more financial help and incentives to help their tenants pay these. And yes, there there are some incentive programs. Uh, for example, BC Hydro has this customer crisis fund, which is a one-time payment for folks that are struggling to pay bills, but there are locations and regions that they don't even have that. Like we heard from folks from Central Interior in BC that there are absolutely no incentives in the region to help households with high energy burden. So we definitely need to do more in that area. And Again, talking about creativity and innovation, uh, some of our participants took the initiative themselves to prepare cooling kits that had drinking water bottles, cooling packs, electrolytes, and you know emergency packets for uh, for their tenants as soon as the news from the heat dome actually reached the region. So, again, creativity and resourcefulness was very much so observant among our housing providers. And interestingly enough, again, um, cooling centers were not one of the uh, best or one of the first options for them because transportation was a big issue for a lot of our housing providers. A lot of folks don't have cars. A lot of folks have mobility issues. So they actually said that a lot of times they they would prefer to see a mobile cooling center that is able to be in the in the area that the tenants are actually living rather than trying to get tenants to uh, regional uh, cooling centers. And again, this shifted their focus to helping their tenants stay pooled and safe within their own units and within their own homes, instead of trying to get into them to cooling centers. And we can see this here again in this quote very directly, uh, transportation can be a challenge. And um, yes, again, that's why cooling, uh, sorry, housing providers were not even thinking about getting their tenants to uh, central cooling centers. And with that, I will just uh, close the presentation with some again key takeaways from our report remembering that climate emergency planning should be targeted and responsive to local conditions. And I'm very happy to see that we had two separate uh, presentations today, one focused on rural and one focused on urban, because it's very true, rural, rural and urban communities experience climate emergencies very differently. And the message that we keep hearing from our housing providers and our members is that housing is the foundation for social, economic, mental and physical well-being. So it is crucial for us to maintain the housing stock and make sure that uh, housing providers can protect the homes that our tenants live in. And remembering that, you know, one size does not fit all. As we design policies and programs and embark on emergency planning, it really should be done in partnership and collaboration with each other and outside of silos, remembering and centering the strains and vulnerabilities and needs of different communities because each are going to be so unique and different. So that's why it's very important for decision makers to adopt the targeted approach. And of course, remembering that multi, multiple crises, right? They all happening at the same time. So extremely does not happen in isolation. So these strategies need to be holistic, right? And take all these complexities into mind. Most importantly, and I hope the one message that we take away from this presentation is that we need to move towards decolonization. These, all of these challenges that I mentioned and many more that are faced by urban indigenous populations are rooted in colonial systems. So we need to take more meaningful steps to actually address these root causes and decolonize and move meaningfully towards reconciliation. And this, this could mean nurturing existing indigenous institutions, supporting indigenous led climate mitigation and adaptation. And of course, above all, centering and uplifting indigenous rights, sovereignty, and ways of being. And with that, 
I will close the presentation. Thank you for listening and staying with me. And I encourage everyone to please go to our website and read the report and reach out if you want. I'd be more than happy to have a conversation. Thank you. I'll pass it on to the other panelists. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And we've had a fantastic chat. Well, it, questions and answers in the chat already. Uh, we are going to ask to ask um, to hold questions until the end um, or keep putting them in the chat as you move to our next presenter. Um, again, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, now we have Hugo Valaquez from Mosaic. Welcome, Hugo. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And nice to meet everyone. I'm just, there we go. Can you see my slides? Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, like I was telling Megan, I'm a huge fan of Vancouver Coastal Health and, and your staff. I used to work at the Consulate of Mexico in charge of the seasonal agriculture workers and kudos to all the, the lives you saved and you keep saving. So also very glad to hear um, uh, Shahid and yes, I agree. We should we should work together to to help um, have vulnerable populations protected in in the coming rough times that might almost be here. So um, I'm the interim director of family and settlement workers of settlement uh, services at Mosaic. Just uh, I'm going to talk about migrant workers today, but um, Mosaic just to give an overview is and we I saw that. We already work with our seniors program. We we are one of the largest settlement agencies in Canada. We help newcomers to Canada to settle. That means refugees, immigrants, migrant workers, uh, international students, anyone that is coming uh, to Canada. Unfortunately, not yet undocumented workers are, are still we uh, um, are advocating because there's half a million in Canada. So. It's a reality, but we, we don't have the money to service them. Um, we have over 40 programs, so we can do wraparound service almost in any aspect of a person's life. I'll give you an example. We have from a program uh, for men that have been violent in their families and want to integrate to, to society to scope that helps immigrants to be part of board of directors and nonprofits. So. I would that's I'd like to give that example to see how the range goes. And we have over 50 locations throughout the uh, the lower mainland. Our revenue is around $40 million. And um, we hope we get more. It's it's gonna be a rough year because there's elections. So I think for all nonprofits, it's gonna be kind of rough. Um we operate mainly in the lower mainland and Surrey. So I just want to recognize that we operate in the traditional and unceded Coast Salish territories, the ancestral lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Kitkat, Tuasin, Coquitlam, Katsi, Semiyamo, and Masque Nations. To give you an overview, because migrant workers um, are, I would say, basically the backbone of many industries in Canada, and we usually do not know them or the general public that doesn't know about their contributions. But I would say that 80% um, of agricultural force in Canada is basically Mexican, Guatemalan or Jamaican. So we wouldn't have food on our tables if it was not for them. Uh, the same with hospitality, uh, caregiving, construction, although construction is mainly undocumented workers. And you can see that in the streets of Vancouver. And um, and I would say caregiving, mainly Filipino um, uh, immigrants. And well, basically almost any aspect of our life, if we didn't have migrant workers, we couldn't go. And it was created as temporary foreign workers. So they wouldn't take positions from Canadians that would want that work or want, that, um, want to do that job. And that's why they come and go from Canada. And some have the opportunity to stay and others not. So this BC Community Capacity Building Project was created because consulates and 
mainly in the agriculture and nonprofits, we're seeing a high percentage of abuse, right? Uh, my team and I, during five years, visited 370 uh, farms, and I would say we have enough data, or we had enough data to prove that 40% of housing was uh, substandard. We evacuated 465 workers and banned 70 farms from the privilege of hiring Mexicans. Uh, that's a reality. ESDC took note and they gave us money to create with Mosaic, where I didn't work before, uh, this program. So as you can see, we did a BC pilot and it got everyone in the room. The feds, province, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Labor, all the consulates and all the nonprofits that serve service migrant workers. It was such a success that it's now replicated across Canada. And I would say that uh, this success also has to do a lot with VCH and what we did with, um, with the workers during COVID. Uh, because we were all on speed dial already from those, those meetings that we had, this was the only province where workers didn't die. And they didn't die because we knew the housing was poor. Everybody acknowledged that. And we need to put them in quarantine or have them do their quarantine in a safe space. So we helped the um, hotel industry and we saved lives all together. So I think that's that was amazing and it wasn't done anywhere else. And because it wasn't done anywhere else, that's why we had three deaths of Mexicans in Ontario. What kind of support do we provide for the migrant workers? Just to give you an overview of how many, because um, I've spoken to the fire chiefs and they really are surprised when they know that there's 70,000 temporary foreign workers in BC at one given moment. And according to WorkSafe BC, because we work very closely together, in a decade, 10% of BC's workforce are gonna be migrant workers. That's a fact. So when you know Chief, former Chief Hull from Abbotsford realized that he had, at one given moment, four to five thousand migrant workers in Abbotsford, he was concerned because when you have an emergency, this pops up, but you don't know that they were there, right? And many speak different languages. So we have two programs. One is the Mosaic program, and we give one-on-one -on -one support, educational sessions, emergency support migrant worker forums, community events. But at the same time, ESDC or Service Canada funds us. And in a very particular way, we become the funders of 26 agencies. So we fund uh, services, wraparound service for migrant workers all around the province. And then for emergencies, we have created a system where we can um, provide help, I would say, in a matter of hours. Um, I'll give you an example uh, pretty soon, but in, in those groups are all of the big agencies you already know, YMCA, Options, Success. Well, Success re receives them at the at the airport and they have another function, but Archway, um, what else, uh, picks, right? From every community and every part, we have Canloops Immigration Services, Vernon, we have people in Osoyos and Terrace with Skina, so we only have problems and glad to partner with anyone with the Northeast, right? Um, Fort St. John and that area is very hard to get partners and the Southeast beyond Creston, it's been, it's been very difficult. So we have monthly meetings with all our collaborating agencies and we try to build this network where we help uh, each other. So just to give you what happened during the BC floods was that Chief Cole said, you know, Hugo, I'm glad that all the nonprofits wants to help, but I, I can't, I can't, um, I can't meet with 26 nonprofits. So I'm going to ask that Mosaic be the focal point in the Integrated Disaster Council. And when something comes up, you'll be the representative of migrant workers in BC and we'll take it from there. And I think that was, uh, that was a good call. We did manage to, with our relationship with the consulates, to identify where 150 workers were, uh, 50 Guatemalans, 100 Mexicans, and some Jamaicans. And we have that connection also because I was a former diplomat. I'm the focal 
point with Mosaic for the consular core. Uh, why is that important? Because if you have a person in an emergency, we can practically call their family members instantly, right? If they're a seasonal agricultural worker, just a database contains their emergency contacts immediately. And that is, a, I think, a very valuable resource with, with the consulates, as well as uh, language and other supports. So how many workers have we served from uh, the last fiscal years? 149,527 and counting. And why is, um, and this is uh, the last 18 months that we got funding. Fortunately, we got funding for two more years. We don't know how that's gonna go with the elections, but at this moment, we're happy that we can still uh, continue. So what have we done during emergencies? In emergencies, what we've done is include all the parties um, in a WhatsApp. And uh, I'll give you an example of the wildfire. So in the same WhatsApp, we had the Consulate of Mexico, Consulate of Guatemala, um, WALI, which is the Western Alliance Labor Initiative with all the employers. Of, of the agricultural sector in BC and um, and all the nonprofits that are on the ground. So I would get a call and say, hey, Hugo, we have 500 uh, workers in Northern Cherries without any help. First, we need confirmation because we're, I'm not gonna bring that to the Inter Integrated Disaster Council where people haven't slept for ages and say, we need this help. We confirm that the consulate will confirm with the employers how many workers are in distress. At the end, there was 100. Uh, and KCR, our local partner in Kelowna, got 100 food hampers in a matter of hours, and they had food, and they were OK. Uh, the same, I think, uh, from Jealous Fruits. Uh, they were evacuated to uh, a ski resort, and about 500 workers were um, also serviced. And when there's somebody in shelters, a mosaic is so big that uh, when you call 911 and you want another language, usually they, they put through one of our interpreters and we can talk almost 89 languages and interpret it um, to assist uh, newcomers or any service, especially emergency services. So that's something that we can also provide. So when, when then we meet with Integrated Disaster Council, we're just briefing on how many people we, uh, we could help together and especially we we only focus on migrant workers. Um, to be fair to first responders, they never discriminate on who they're gonna help. They always help everyone. But once the whole population or the people that they're helping are in a shelter, it becomes another story because they don't speak the language. They don't know how to access to the, to the help. I'll give you an example. Usually the Red Cross will say, hey, there's $200 for everyone that has their SIN number right now and just, you know, we can help with that, but how can you relate that to a Guatemalan worker that only speaks Mayan, right? Or a Ukrainian that doesn't speak English and is in the Northeast. Um, that that happens and it happens in every emergency. And I think uh, it's, it's uh, also I'm concerned about what you were mentioning, uh, Shahid, about the power. Um, in agriculture, uh, BC, BC employers are obligated to provide housing and they're obligated to keep that housing cool, but it doesn't always happen, right? I think the obligation is to keep it between 18 and 25 degrees or 23 degrees. And if that doesn't happen, then we have emergency funds to also provide um, at least fans and reach out to them and also report them to the proper authorities. And we're also connected with the integrity services, which is the investigative branch of the federal government when these uh, when this is happening, and they can also help us uh, pressure in these points. So, what kind of support? It's very innovative. Um, that's why it's being replicated, and we're creating uh, new spaces for emergencies and for any kind of information we have to provide to the workers. So, Wally, the employers created a an app where we can also communicate with the workers what their rights are, what the necessities. What to do in an emergency, right? Um, unfortunately, like you were saying, some of them come from from countries where it's it's hotter, but not all of them, right? If you come from the mountains in Mexico, it's cold, but still people have that stereotype that oh, you come from Guatemala or India, and then you can get you can 
you can just you know bear the heat. No, it's not true. Um, we evacuated some workers that um, almost pa that passed out in a heat wave in Abbotsford uh, a few years ago, and they had to be taken to the hospital because they were made to work at 40 degrees at 2 p.m. And that happens every day as well. Uh, to be fair, there's a lot of good growers, uh, and and what I've done now is work with them. As part of Mosaic, I'm also the chair of AgSafe, which is a association that is BC-wide and it's employer-driven and we help with safety and health. So we can also pair with AgSafe. We have people all over the province and they also uh, speak different languages and have, uh, in this case, it's an emergency. It's very important also. We have launched last week two mental health programs, one with Mexico and one with Guatemala and the workers are serviced by someone in Mexico City and in Guatemala City, so it's culturally appropriate when they have an emergency and they feel distress or mental health distress. Um, the bill is covered by the by a fund of AgSafe and they are serviced in their own language, so we can also help in an emergency for that and that helps. In any, in any health crisis, I think that's also very important. Um, we're also working on pre-arrival know your rights English courses for them, so they come before before they come. To, they have they have um knowledge of what's happening. There is an issue, and we've been advocating for years. I would say for ten years on having MSP upon arrival for the workers. This was only possible when when there was COVID, right? Because the only Airplane allowed in, in Canadian airspace was the first plane with 100 workers from Mexico City to YBR once the uh, prime minister declared them essential. And um, and yeah, then they had MSP upon arrival, but now they don't. And it's an issue because not always the employers provide a private insurance while they have MSP. So that can also come up either in emergencies or on a daily basis. And I think it also increases the cost of of the health service because they end up in the emergency room when they could go to a to a clinic to get that help right and um yeah we've we've voiced it out um there is the consular alliance for the protection of migrant workers which includes mexico guatemala jamaica the philippines el salvador <clears throat> um, these countries and they advocate together to to have um, these matters resolved and also would are willing to to work with all of you in any matter that might come. Um, emergencies. So we reached out to the federal government and, and told them, you know, that more and more this this emergencies are a reality, and we need specific funds for it. It's not more like, oh, this is an extra. No, we need to. It has to be part of our permanent budget as nonprofit to have emergency funds allocated. And first we had 50K, 100K given to us by the Clack Foundation. And with that, we had the hard data to show the feds um, what we needed. And then now it's a permanent thing that we have uh, emergency funds. Oh, well, I'm gonna run out of battery, but what, what, we, what we do with that money is we can provide up to $1,000, $500 in housing, mobility, accessibility, medical emergencies, wage loss. And we do that practically immediately, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, I can't disclose the country, but uh, Caribbean Island, uh, the, the worker last weekend was kicked out of the hotel where he was working in uh, Tofino. And we can provide a shelter and transportation and food so he could go to uh, another employer or we could get an open work permit so he can get further. Um, and we do this and we also help the family members as well, right? A little bit of red tape, we're working on that, but worst case scenario, if it's very urgent, I will take the risk and I will give Mosaic's credit card and we will help the person and then we can deal with donations to cover that. And yes, that's about it. Um, please feel free to call me or if we you would like to present uh, what we're doing to the 23 agencies 
in our meetings. I would be glad to, to provide that space for anyone that wants to connect with all agencies at the same moment. Uh, I think it's very important that we work together because nobody has all the resources to do it. And that's why um, we're not close to working with responsible employers and, and workers as well, and anyone in the province, because governments who have, I used to be a public servant. I know public servants work very hard. Uh, and But when you're a public servant, you can't say what you think all the time or do what you want. I understand that. So um, my respect to you. And yes, let's work together in anything we can do. Thank you very much. I'm going to get a charger because I'm going to lose my battery. But uh, if you have any questions, I'm right here. Thank you so much, Hugo. Um, just in the interest of time, we're going to move to our next presenter, um, but please continue answer, asking your questions in the Q&A and we'll get those answered. Um, and so our, our final presenter today is Anne-Marie Nichol. She's an associate professor at SFU um, and she's going to talk about do-it-yourself air cleaners. Please go ahead. I think Hugo might have to stop sharing before I can share my screen. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Can people see my screen? Thumbs up. It's really zoomed in. It looks like the corner. Um, can you see it there? Uh, not yet. We're just seeing you right now. Maybe try again. Hang on, I'll try again. Share screen, PowerPoint. There you yeah. go, yeah. How's that? Good, perfect. Great, okay. Uh, thank you and hello. I am an associate professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at SFU. I'm working on a project in conjunction with BC Lung. I'm here today to to basically promote the sessions that we're hosting today, uh, hosting this summer. I'm joined today by our project manager, Prem, who's gonna be answering questions in the chat if you have them. And what we're offering to communities is a model of workshops where we're helping people help themselves, uh, protect themselves during fire smoke events, which we anticipate to be significant again this summer. So I'd just like to begin by saying that our university respectfully acknowledges the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, sorry, I've been talking all day, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Kwikwetlam, Semiamu, and Tawasin's people on whose unceded traditional territories our three campuses reside. Last year, we developed this workshop model in conjunction with many of these partners, and we focused our work on Vancouver and the Eastern Fraser Valley. And the goal was to learn how to create a workshop model that would be uh, appropriate for hosting in communities where we talk to people about the hazards of wildfire smoke and what they can do to protect themselves. And I'm sure that you probably already heard some of this information already about fires in the coming summer, but we do anticipate, um, I also work at the BCCDC in conjunction with some of the fire smoke folks there, they anticipate that our wildfire season will be bad this year, in part exacerbated by the drought conditions that we're going into it with. Um, and again, I won't go over what the health effects of fire smoke are, except to say that the one piece that we're really working on in this project is helping people access air cleaning technologies to protect their indoor air shed. And so a lot of the times a recommendation from public health is that people are to go inside. And that's one thing if you live in a house that has good ventilation, a good HVAC system, but we know that there's many, many people for whom that situation does not exist. And so the goal of this project very much has a health equity lens. We're looking at providing education and resources to people who either can't control their housing environment or can't afford to buy the kinds of technologies that would allow them to keep their indoor air shed space safe. We're also focused on people who are medically vulnerable, um, and you'll see that as this comes along. So again, we, we created a workshop model where we educate people, we provide tools, we build these DIY air cleaners, and I'll explain why we chose these uh, units in the next few slides. And then the workshop has about a 30 minute Q&A the air cleaners were selected because it was a technology that was developed during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
these units that we build with communities are able to reduce 0.3 micron particles, including virions, pollens, mold spores, and PM 2.5 and other ultrafine particles from the air. This has been rigorously scientifically analyzed. Dr. Angela Eichelbosch at the National Collaborating Center published this publicly accessible review. The results of her very deep dive into whether or not these devices work turned out that DIY air cleaners are an effective, affordable, and accessible solution to the problem of indoor smoke. The technologies that, that are needed to create these units, which I'll show you in a minute, are simple things that are purchased easily at hardware stores pretty much throughout BC. And we've spent a lot of time looking at Canadian Tire and Home Depot and True Value Hardware. And it is true that you can access all of these materials pretty much anywhere that you can also buy hammers and nails. We chose though a unit that is small because we were often working with low income seniors um, and people in smaller types of housing units. So just to point out that the kinds of technology that the government recommends people use are often expensive. They clock in at starting at about $300 uh, and upwards for a good HEPA filter air quality air, air quality device. You've probably seen them, Honeywell or Lavoit. The ones that work, work well, but they tend to be about $300 and up. And you often need one per room. So for the auspices of this project, they are Corsi Rosenthal box. So if anyone in public health has heard that term before, it is a variation. It is the small version of the Corsi Rosenthal box. It's a one by one, it's called. It has one fan and one filter. And there's also pretty much one roll of duct tape. I don't know why there's balloons coming up around me, but um, we also had to be cognizant to the fact that many of the people that we worked with, particularly in the downtown east side of in Vancouver, um, people came on transit and we needed to make sure that these units that we built were transit accessible. So this is a workshop we had last week with some Japanese seniors and you can see that we were able to, the, the units are quite light. Um, they fit back in the box that they came in and we rigged up a little handy carrier so people can take them home on transit. So we worked out this sort of format for a workshop. We usually do 20, 20 to 25 people per session. Uh, it takes us about two hours. We tend to have these tables, those kind of folding tables work quite well. We can't host them outside just because you never quite know what the weather is going to be. And if the filters get wet, that's a problem. But you can see what there's the fan, the box, the fan comes in this box and that's a filter. And that's just sort of a filter that you would use in a forced air furnace. So that's why, again, these are things that are simple, simply accessible at hardware stores because these are things people use all the time. So through our last year's work, we created a YouTube video, uh, a TikTok, that's what this is, um, resources, a shopping list. And the whole goal was to make these accessible enough. They're translated now into Chinese and Japanese. Uh, we're working on other languages as well. And we really want this to go viral. So we want people to make these units and then we want them to show their community members how to make them too. And that way they're kind of doing the work of pushing it out into the community so that people can learn how to help themselves. They're also very useful during supply chain issues. So last year in the East Coast, we know that they ran out of HEPA filters in department stores and hardware stores. So people were left to kind of build their own. So these are a stopgap solution, even for people who can afford filters, you can't buy one, these are useful to help improve your indoor air quality during extreme events. Sorry, that's the TikTok. Hopefully I can move it ahead. Uh, uh oh, <laughs> here, I'm gonna stop and come back. Hopefully that is stopped for you guys. Yeah, it stopped. I want to go see the TikTok now. So I'm going to do after. <laughs> if I can't see you guys now. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. We can't see the slides. Oh, no. And now I'm stuck on this thing. Prem, are you there? Can you perhaps? Okay, I might have to get off of this presentation. I'm sorry and restart my computer. Oh, okay. no. Hang on one sec. I think I've got it. No. I'm sorry, Amy, I'm going to have to come back or I could just keep talking. I can't see myself talking, but if you can see me talk talking, I will just keep talking. You can keep talking. Is that okay? Okay. So long story short, um, we are offering these sessions again. We've been fortunate to receive some funding so far. 
including from the First Nations Health Authority, to take these sessions outside of Vancouver um, and the Lower Mainland. And I'm quite interested in that because we know these are areas that are more affected by fire smoke. Uh, and these, and the fire smoke just tends to be more frequent and more intense. And so what I'm really looking for are community partners that we can work with to host these workshops. Uh, right now, the units, for us to give the units away for free, if we buy in bulk, it's about $75 per unit. So we tend to need about $2,500 to host sessions to hand out free materials for people. There are other models of running these workshops. We could do a fee, but we've yet to engage on collecting money for the sessions, mostly because we had a health equity lens. So for me, the most important thing is meeting partners who would like to offer these workshops. I can tell you they're very well attended. Um, we have to, expectation management is actually one of our biggest challenges is how can we get people the, the devices that they need? And we don't want to have too many people show up and then have to turn people away. And as it gets smokier, we're already starting to get more and more interest from different communities who would like to have them. So I'm not able to show you this at the moment, but we have a train the trainer guide. So if people want to learn how to make them themselves and then take the technologies into communities and host resources themselves, we do have this guide for hosting a workshop and we're basically running that this summer. So we can only do so many of these and I'm only funded for so many, but we definitely have made it easy for you. If you'd like to host them yourselves, you can meet with us. We could train one of you who are responsible for community groups, and then you could take this idea and roll it out with your communities and hopefully let us know actually how it goes, because that would be helpful. Um, so I think that I don't have many, I didn't have much more else to say. I was going to show people what the units look like in practice, but I'm a bit frozen here on this side. But on the, but just to say, if you would like to reach out, um, I think maybe Prem could put some information in the chat and I'd be happy to talk to people a bit more about how we could bring this technology to your community uh, or look for funding sources so that we could apply for money so that we could uh, turn around and host them and provide them for free. Because really, if people can afford to buy HEPA filters, then they should do that. And if you can't, then there are alternatives such as this program. Okay, and I will end there. And I'm gonna get off and try to come back and answer maybe some questions afterwards, Amy. So I'm gonna get off the workshop and then I'll come back. We do have, Prem was able to share one of your documents. So he, he pulled up some pictures there to show what they looked like. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Prem. And um, maybe he could put the link to the Train the Trainer guide. That's hosted by BC Lung, who is our partner. Okay, thanks. And I'll come back in two secs. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. Um, very exciting. Um, so we're going to move now into our final portion of our, of our workshop today. Uh, our Q&A session. So we have uh, Dr. Michael Schwant from Vancouver Coastal with us today to answer any questions that you folks have. Um, we do want to say that we do recognize that rural challenges are a little bit different or a lot different than uh, urban communities. And so we're also hoping while we're doing the Q&A that folks might be able to type into the chat what are some of the specific the rural specific challenges that are coming with the smoke and the heat. And also if there's any uh, resources that you think would be helpful from the health authorities in particular, which is unfortunately is not necessarily always grants, which I know is always really helpful. Um, but with that, uh, we'd love to get started with questions. Uh, you can either put up your hand or um, please type them in the Q&A or in the box. Well, um, I appreciate everyone is, is thinking. I know we've had a lot of information in a small amount of time, so we really appreciate oh, yeah. that. One here from uh, Sarah Freeland. Uh, what advice do you have for Indigenous, uh, for an Indigenous nonprofit housing and service providers to connect with local health authorities? Okay, should we pass it to Michael? What do you think? 
Sure, I'm glad to get started and I definitely welcome others additions as well. <laughs> and you know, my first answer would be thank you for reaching out to your local health authority. We're glad to help whether with that public health advice on some of the planning and actions that can be taken uh, both in events and for longer range planning as well. And then as well as that, I know we have both Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health communities on the line. I think that whichever is uh, relates to your community, I know that some organizations will be operating in both, so you can have your pick, but I think that Vancouver Coastal Health, where I am, and Fraser Health would both be very glad to hear from uh, your organization. And then really, I think it's a matter of kind of tailoring that support to, to what the needs are, depending on what the project work is that we're discussing and so forth. And then finally, I'd only uh, note as well for operations that are within First Nations geographically, within First Nations communities as well, we work closely with First Nations Health Authority too. So sometimes we bring them into the picture, but really we want to make sure that the support is what's best for the organization, uh, its community, and the uh, the folks that are being, uh, that the organization is serving. But in short, uh, just consider it an open door uh, to be in touch with, I mean, we try to try to take the approach that any door is the right one, but both of our uh, health authorities have general intake sort of emails for healthy environments work. And you might also have specific contacts, whether that's someone like myself as a medical health officer, someone like Megan, Amy, others who are working with uh, different organizations. So that's all I would say for now. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Go ahead, Megan. Sorry. Go ahead, Hugo. Thanks. Hi, it's nice to meet you, Michael. Um, a quick question. Sometimes in rural areas, um, it's very hard to get to the to the health centers. Is there any support for transportation that we we could? Um, because it's uh, usually we get volunteers to get you know the migrant workers there, or people that are around. Sometimes the employer wants to, uh, is able, but sometimes like in the BC floods, to be fair to employers, they were saving their farms and they had no way to take workers to, to a, a health facility. Oh, sorry, Michael, you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, great question, very important. And we know that the, the distance and transportation options can be barriers. Um, I would say that, you know, a couple of the things that we're working on are with local communities trying to explore with municipal governments and with NGOs, what are the transportations in place to better understand them and then try to support this because we don't want transportation to be a barrier for people to get to cooler spaces if necessary and to healthcare, as you're pointing out to the health centers themselves, if necessary. One of the things that I'd mentioned and uh, my colleagues at Vancouver Coastal Health, Healthy Environments, including Laura, might have more to say on the, the topic of our developing work on transportation for uh, climate preparedness. But one of the things that I'd note is our Climate Change Catalyst Grants Program uh, does have funding to help organizations uh, work on activities related to climate resilience, related to protecting the communities that they serve uh, through climate events. So that's something that the amount that, that that's there might be helpful for um, for providing, whether that's something like supporting transportation, drivers, fuel, some of the costs associated with even taxi potentially, if that's the need and the best fit. Uh, so something along the lines of funding, uh, transportation supports, I think would be a good fit for that. And so I don't know if the, uh, maybe we can post a link to that grant program that's in the website and it uh, could be an option. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, sorry, Megan, I think I keep cutting you off. Nope, go for it. All good. I was just going to say we have another question, which is, have any health authorities created um, mobile cooling centers? Not to... Uh, Michael, you probably know. Why don't you go ahead, Amy? You were in uh, oh. in full flight there. Why don't you go ahead? And oh, no, I was just going to say, I don't think that, like, not to the best of my knowledge, um, I, this is something that they do in like Montreal. There's, um, they actually use buses for this, but we haven't been able to um, work on it. At least with, on the Fraser side, we haven't been able to work on any partnerships with bus companies on this. Um, I know that there are mobile, well, there are buses used for warming in some places in BC, but I don't think it's been done in our regions yet. Um, Michael, what would you like to add? 
Yeah, in terms of health authorities creating and operating cooling centers, not at this point in Vancouver Coastal Health. We've tried to provide support for municipal governments and for community organizations to create and run cool spaces. So there's that uh, document on how to do that. So some of the characteristics of a uh, highly functioning cooling center that are on our website. And as well as that, you know, similarly to the question on transportation, uh, there's some funding available. So if a, a um, uh, NGO, for example, would like to make its space into a cooling site, we know that it's very important that people are able to have cool and clean air right in the spaces that they're going to in the course of their day-to-day -day lives with trusted staff and, and volunteers around and not necessarily going out of the way to a major cooling center is often preferred by people and can often be uh, more appropriate to their needs as well. So we're trying to provide that support um, again with that uh, climate resilience grant program that people might apply, for example, for support for portable air conditioning or air filtration, uh, for other things that might be helpful towards creating cooling spaces. And then finally, I'll mention that there is the, uh, you might have heard about the BC Hydro program delivering uh, air conditioning to individuals, to their homes. BC Hydro has also provided some support for organizations that are seeking, again, either portable air conditioner, uh, potentially heat pump, some funding towards that, or uh, and or air filtration. So we can help connect you with that program as well, uh, because oftentimes we, we're learning that the physical plant, this physical spaces that sites that organizations are using might be older. It might just like most buildings in, B in Southwestern BC not be up for the task of the changing climate. So getting those devices is something we can try to facilitate, whether through our own grants program or connecting you to BC Hydro's program. Can I ask a question then of Megan? The grants that you're speaking of, are those just for uh, Vancouver Coastal or are those province-wide? Do you guys know? Unfortunately, those are just Vancouver. It's for the eligibility for those grants are for nonprofits and First Nations across the BCH region. Okay, thank you. That and that goes all the way up to Pemberton, correct? Yeah, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health is Sea to Sky um, up to... Uh, just around Pemberton, it's sort of vague when it gets up that direction. Um, and then also uh, Sunshine Coast uh, up to Powell River, basically. Um, and then also Central Coast. Um, and within Metro Vancouver, it's North Shore, Vancouver and Richmond. And White Rock? No, fortunately not. That's right. Okay. It's over on Amy's side. That's right. We've had this conversation. Thanks. That's great that that funding exists. Oh, thanks, Michael. I didn't know there was a link. Thanks for grabbing that. That's easier than emailing us. Please check out the link. And Davey shared um, some information about transportation on the Sunshine Coast, I believe. Uh, we have provided free bus passes for vulnerable people to be able to travel on the air-conditioned buses. The bus passes were for town of Gibson's. The Recreation Center and Mall have also extended hours to provide access to the Gap Town of Gibsons. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Davey. I know that's something that comes up quite a bit in Vancouver with heat response as well, um, and, and sort of across some of our partners in the Vancouver Coastal Health region. Um, like transportation is a challenge, especially for community organizations just trying to provide transportation for typical programs that aren't during emergency periods. Um, you know, I, I've heard about challenges trying to employ or get volunteer drivers. Um, there's been talk about ideas around sharing a driver. So trying to have, you know, if you only need a driver for one day a week for your programs, could you share the same driver with other community organizations so that person can have full-time employment? And you might be more likely to attract someone to that position and be able to maintain or keep someone in that position. Um, as Michael mentioned, transportation is something that we're trying to explore. Um, there's been some creative ideas. I know um, as some communities have looked at, you know, potentially like taxi vouchers and trying to have some of those options for emergencies. Um, it is a conversation we're trying to explore because we think that transportation isn't going to be, there's not one clear solution for everything. It's going to be taking um, partners at various levels working together to try to find solutions. So um, if you're interested in sharing more information about that or challenges or barriers you're facing, please reach out to us. We're happy to have that conversation and we are um, wanting to explore that further going forward.
I don't see any other questions in the chat. If anyone else has questions, though, for other presenters as well, they are still on the line. Um, so they're welcome. They're able to answer questions about the programs that they spoke about. We didn't get to see Anne Marie's fun pictures, but they actually made box fan filters that had very cool straps so you could carry your air filter onto the bus. I love that. And the stickers, I have to say, oh, yeah. like that was actually the nicest part of those workshops is at the end people stay and then they decorate their unit. And that's where we really get to talk to people about climate anxiety. And what, what we're really hearing is that people are concerned. They're, they know that the smoke is not good for them. They don't know how to protect themselves. They're worried about smoke and heat together. And I think that, you know, in the public health community, we need to be doing more to move the information that we already know into the people and the places that can use it. Yeah. And some of that, I think you're right. We were hearing that, that some of that from Shahad as well. It's like, it's having people who are um, in those community spaces and be able to have some of those informal conversations and already have relationships with people or are in the room in your case with the workshops. Like I think that's, it is really those places, right. That help move some of that forward. And we've been lucky a few times to have clinicians come and talk to people. They questions they have about medications and what to do during fire smoke if they've got lung diseases already. So that's helpful too when community health practitioners want to come and take part. And just, I guess I didn't get to say the rest of my pitch, but we also recognizing the impact of smoke on the developing fetus. We're really interested in recruiting people who are pregnant into our workshops this summer. So we will be working in the Fraser Valley. So if there's anyone here that's been in the Fraser Valley or actually interior health uh, with prenatal populations, this is a new area for us, but it is one that's been flagged as particularly impactful, recognizing that fire smoke does impact fetal development and birth outcomes. So I'd be really interested in finding a partner that is doing prenatal services and we could do some workshops uh, around those folks. Really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. We have uh, Eden shared something in the chat here about some of the work their organization is doing. They're in Fraser or in Fraser Health nonprofit providers and OPS sites. We often set up misting tents, but no specific mobile cooling vans. I think that's to do with the question about mobile cooling options. Thanks for sharing that, Eden. Uh, we actually had that earlier today on the urban uh, webinar. We had presentation from folks in the working in the downtown east side, Van Du, um, and they were sharing about missing tents that they were setting up and heat response for um, heat waves in the downtown east side. Um, and, and they found that it was also similarly helpful and it was also a space to kind of come together and share information about heat um, response and you know how to protect yourself and adaptations you can make if you're living in an SRO and um, or if you're outside often in times um, during the heat. Um, so I think missing stations are not just a chance to cool off, but also a chance to kind of chat and get some support from other folks in the community. And it was interesting, they were saying as well, uh, for folks on the call too, that for, because they serve folks that um, are, are drinkers in the community that often face barriers inside if they're drinking, that they're going out onto the street is where they feel like they're, it's, they feel safe drinking. But then the challenge with that though, is if po folks are discouraged from drinking in public places, then they may not have anyone around them. So if they're um, encountering health concerns with drinking or um, using substances, we wanna prevent having them being isolated. So having some of these public spaces um, where it's appropriate can be a, a chance to, um, have supports for people who might be overdosing, for example, or experiencing withdrawal symptoms. I'm not seeing too many more questions popping up, but um, I also haven't seen too many answers about what, what are some of those rural specific uh, barriers that folks are facing. I know we only have um, five more minutes and of course we could always let folks go early, but um, we'd really love to get as much information as possible so we can best support your organizations. If there's anything that folks would like to share. And again, if you think about something later, you can always contact us at the emails that um, well, you were invited from, um, but we will share out a package of um, resources to everyone who came. Um, or signed up uh, at the uh, in the next couple of days. 
It's also a new model for us. Historically, we've done uh, our webinars with all folks across the VCH and Fraser Health region this year. We decided to uh, split them up and do an urban and a rural remote focus. So if you've got any feedback around that, we'd love to hear that. Like if you think it worked well, if you think, you know, you'd rather go back to the one big room next time, that's also fine. Or if you've got ideas um, you'd like to see for the ones next year, we'd always love to get feedback. I actually have a, a small question, um, just curious. So actually very related to what you just said, like webinars and online and uh, I guess information sharing through internet. I'm wondering uh, what the health authorities, actually what challenges they think exist when it comes to reaching folks that may not have access to internet or folks who are not comfortable accessing things on social media and everything. Like, Do you have specific channels of communication or is it that uh, is it more retroactive that you wait for folks to come to you and say, oh, like we can't reach folks online. Can you help us, you know, with information sharing? Or are you more proactive about that? Just curious. Um, I can I can give a try. I can try to give a bit of a, a start. So um, as far as reaching folks who don't have internet access or don't comfortable with internet access. That's one of the reasons why we're trying so hard to partner with uh, different groups like the folks online. Um, our comms can only do so much. We do share a lot out through social media and we do provide a lot of those, um, a lot of the resources that we have talked about earlier today through um, through these emails and we hope people can print them and share them in a, in a hard copy. Um, on the Fraser side, we do send that information to libraries and hope that they print them out. And libraries, I get very excited because I'm always a, a library fan, but that is one of those that most trusted places for information for seniors and for folks who are, are new to Canada and people that may not know what their health authority is. So um, that's something that we've been trying to do. I know that in one community in, in Fraser, they're actually putting some information in um, the books that they are sending out to those mobile book programs. Um, I know in one community, um, we're trying to connect with Meals on Wheels. I don't know that we've actually done it, but just trying to be more creative with how we reach out to those folks, because it's not really our traditional way of getting information out, but we do know that that's a problem. And there's also some, I'll just say, there's also some um, barriers when it comes to information to try to find people who are more, so more socially isolated. Um, so there's privacy issues. So I, I do appreciate that some um, organizations will, you know, screen all of their clients and ask, are you okay if we check in on you? Um, are we are you okay if we share information with you? And sometimes that's through the phone um, or there's some doctor's offices um, that are do that have screened their client lists, uh, at least to do health, like heat check-ins. Now, I don't know about sharing pro proactive information. Um, they, they might be, I just, I'm not on that side of things. Um, so basically, we're trying to be more creative when it comes to um, sending out information. Um, I know um, one of the the migrant worker organizations that we support um, did print out and send a lot of the um, the workers pamphlet, the workers um, posters that we had created uh, with some of their care packages uh, last summer. So again, those innovative partnerships would love to explore more of them. Um, uh, Megan and Michael, I'll let you jump in. Hugo, I see you have your hand up too. Uh, well, I just wanted to add to offer um, Mosaic services for any partnership. I think uh, our ability to, when, when language is a barrier, we can definitely be a partner uh, with anyone in, in a matter of minutes sometimes if it's an emergency, and if not, we can even translate legal documents if necessary, medical documents as well. That's one. Um, we're also going to have a clinic for vulnerable populations in, in partnership with the uh, city of Burnaby. So um, we once we have, if anybody wants more information, that's, that's way over my preview, but uh, if you need information, and that's more for the doctors, but that's one of our new services that we can also um, share. And if any information is needed to be shared with our, our 23 partners, we can also share it in a click. So if Vancouver Coastal Health or any of the 
anyone attending right now would like to, you know, connect with the main nonprofits of, of BC, we could do it also in a click and, and, and have those people connected if necessary. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you. You know, we're getting close to time here. Uh, there's a few just comments I just want to acknowledge in the chat. Um, these might be questions we'll have to come back to, and we we do answer questions um, in our post-webinar package, and we can send that out. Um, Sarah Freelan asked, uh, many tenants have mobility challenges and require trauma-informed services. They often don't leave their homes during an emergency. How can we bring services to them? Um, I, think, I think we've addressed a bit of that through this discussion of trying to find different pathways into folks in community um because it's it is challenging right if it's whether it's through community organizations that people trust um and they already have relationships with um last webinar we actually had someone share a really great idea about how they've been working with folks that maybe you're a bit hesitant to have supports to have them help share messaging through the community so having them be someone who's um you know sharing information and having some agency in that and and helping support other community members as well and, and through that they're having discussions around heat preparedness and they're getting that person involved in the process and they found that that was helpful um and so I think it is just trying to work with as many possible levers and spaces as we can to try to get messaging out. Um, yeah, and then Janine has a great question here about videos. I don't know if there's anything that you know of, Hugo, this is you're talking specifically to show temporary workers and newcomers. Um, I'm thinking some of that's around heat and smoke response. Um, we'll have to look and see if there's ones that are transit. I think there's a number that, ha number that have captions, um, but we'll see what we can find. We'll put that in the package that we send around. Um, is some of the nurses line access. oh the nurses line there is 811 health link bc that does have access to interpreters so if you call 811 um it is challenging you basically have to go on and try to say your language in english um but then if you wait they will connect you to a an, a, to connect an interpreter onto the line so that would connect them with a nurse and an interpreter you can maybe you have more information on that yes um there's there are videos but mainly about the workers rights some health issues but if you have a video if you want to do it i'm sure that the consulates would be very interested in the nonprofits, and we can do two things we can have those videos um, be shown to the workers before they arrive to canada right by their ministry of labor both and we can even do it also with i think uh, jamaica and uh, the philippines mexico and that's the bulk and with nonprofits, we, we have a, all the nations, I mean, from all over newcomers, we can also provide that that video, right? And I think uh, if there's, we can search together if there's no uh, money, I'm sure WorkSafe BC would be interested in that as well. And we can connect, we can make that connection. And I would say AgSafe would be interested in those videos as well. Oh, great idea. We'll have to chat after you go, thanks. Yeah. Um... And then Anne Marie also shared in the chat that thanks for, um, for bringing that forward. Anne Marie, BC Center for Disease Control, has many resources on wildfire smoke and health in many different languages. So some of those box fan filter information that Anne Marie's been talking about, they've got fact sheets on that website. Also, um, information about masks, um, people who are exercising outdoors or working outdoors, um, and how to pick out an air cleaner. Those fact sheets are translated as well. Yeah, there are many, many languages on that site, which is helpful. There's also extreme heat resources that are there too. Definitely, yeah. Prepare BC has a number that are translated. Uh, City of Vancouver has actually some of the other languages that, that aren't on the provincial site. So I found that's kind of been a handy one to add in additional coverage if we need some languages more for heat. I think they have less on smoke, but yeah. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any more. I'm just going to double check. Megan, I don't see any more questions. Do you see any more questions? I think that's most of them for now. Um, and we'll be sure to go through the chat and double check if there's anything that we've missed. And we'll send those out in the post webinar package. Thanks so much, everyone, for the questions. Yes, thanks so much. And so we'll we'll close for now. And we just wanted to say thank you so much, everyone, for attending, for all your wonderful questions, to our, our speakers for sharing the great work that they're doing. And just as a reminder, we will be sharing out all of the resources that we have with you in the next couple of days and a recording of the presentations that you can share or rewatch. 
Um, so thank you so much for being with us. And again, if you have any questions, please do reach out to our teams. We're happy to support you. And thanks for all the great work you're doing. Take care.